My name is Mark Hansen. Uh, my wife, Kate, and myself moved into this house about eight months ago. We have the geothermal uh, with 14 100 foot deep wells out in our backyard. We have a uh, GCT 024, which is a combo unit. It does radiant in floor, um, hot water heating, along with forced air heating and air conditioning. Uh, we're doing 100% of the domestic hot water with a high temperature unit. Uh, that was a early design, uh, decision in the design phase because in addition to the capability of powering it with electricity, we power it at an incredibly high efficiency level. You can't match the efficiency of the geothermal heat pump and it's quiet. You don't hear air piping through vents at three in the morning because there isn't piping through vents. It's heated up. The floor, the floor just radiates that heat up. Welcome to the tour of the Minnesota Victorian Net Zero Certified Home Renovation. This course is approved for uh, 1.5 hours of continuing education units. Um, GBCI, Mary Green, uh, Certified Green Professional, Certified Green Home Professional, AIBD. Um, it will also be approved for Building Performance Institute at a non-whole house, so less than 1.5, uh, as well as uh, the Lead Accredited Professional in Homes. It's also approved for AIA Health, Welfare and Safety, HSW, and may be applicable to your local state-based design or contractor license. Uh, for this course, I will be your producer, your interviewer, and camera phone operator. My name is Brett Little, and I am the executive director here at the Green Home Institute. Green Home Institute is a nonprofit with a mission to empower people to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the renovation and construction of the places we live. Uh, and just follow along with us. We're going to be bringing you behind the scenes on multiple projects across the country, single family, multifamily mixed use, uh, mid-rise, high-rise, residential buildings, uh, new construction, renovations, guts, uh, urban, rural, suburban, you name it, we'll be there behind the scenes asking the tough questions. So make sure to join us. Uh, very excited about this project. Um, uh, after we did the filming um, and put the course content together, they achieved their official International Living Future Institute Living Building Challenge zero energy certification. So not the full-blown living building challenge certification, but the one that primarily focuses on um, the uh, just zero energy usage over the course of a year. So very excited to share that with you all. Um, and so for this course, we're gonna be taking a tour um, with the design, build, and HVAC team, as well as one of the homeowners of this stunning Victorian rehab that's now turned to zero energy capable certified uh, lead Platinum and uh, Green Star Platinum pending as well. So uh, I hope you join us and have a good time. Good morning. I'm Stuart Herman. I'm the homeowner. I'm Mark Sloot. I'm the architect with Sala Architects. I'm Laura Sina and I'm with Innovative Power Systems, the solar installer. And I'm Andres with Morrissey Builders. My name is Jeff Fawbush. I work for Morrissey Builders as a carpenter on the site here. I'm Jason with Mossman Geothermal. We did the geothermal installation on the project. All right. This project has been underway for two and a half years. Uh, we had two goals. One was to make a house that would achieve net zero. And as it turns out, it's actually net positive. The second goal, which is equally important, is that we wanted to take an old house in an old neighborhood, in an old city, and show that it could be made uh, attractive, comfortable, and convenient with, and achieve net zero with no sacrifice in attracting this comfort or convenience. As an architect, I can say that this aligns great with my passions. Um, Stuart and uh, his wife Linda came to me um, early on with those two goals, and that's, that's exactly what I want to be doing, and so uh, we got off to a great start. Um, I might also just add that uh, from a, a, a greater sustainability point of view, a beauty is incredibly important. Um, it is, uh, as, as humans, we're um, you know, hardwired to cherish and preserve things that we love. 
and uh, as we know that you know we have limited resources on the on this planet and uh, so if we have a, a, a an ethic and of, of uh, cherishing and preserving and not just uh, consumption and throw away um, that can have a huge huge impact and where are we at right now <laughs> Uh, we're in the Harriet neighborhood of Minneapolis, mm -hmm. and it is the end of July on a lovely sunny day. Mm -hmm. Whittier neighborhood. Whittier neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in Minnesota, climate zone 6, uh, very cold in the wintertime. Uh, we also get extreme uh, high temperatures in the summertime as well, so uh, Minnesota has really a, a broad um, spectrum of climate that we have to uh, deal with. Right. Let's go on in. Very good. <laughs> As we go in, Brett, um, you know, just want to point out the importance of team. You know, every project, a team is super important, but on this project and any like, like really high-performing project, that gets emphasized even more. And um, here's a, a little sign that we had for the project um, that uh, emphasizes some of the, the special partners and team that we had. And uh, so there were there were some companies that um, you know really wanted to embrace this project as well, and so um, they helped contribute in a in a bigger way than than uh, even on most projects. So. Uh, Anderson windows with all the, the, the windows in here, triple pane, um, certainty, flap and lighting, Glen Book Rumber, uh, Warner Stallion for all the appliances, um, and then on the left there, the builders and Asala and uh, Building Knowledge, the energy performing uh, company here, uh, the testing, energy performance testing. This house, we wanted to preserve as much as we could of the original. Um, actually, we upgraded it considerably, but what we were able to preserve was the flooring, and then also the millwork on the, where we put it all on the second floor. But we had to redesign it considerably in order to accommodate, uh, for example, the mechanicals. The ceilings are all, used to be nine feet, they've been dropped to eight feet in order to make room to put all the ductwork, uh, the piping, and the wiring, and keep it out of sight. We did the coves uh, in each one of the rooms really helped to define mm -hmm. uh, those rooms, but also to maintain that sense of volume. Mm -hmm. And so a real kind of uh, adds to the, the character of the home and really kind of preserves um, you know, what uh, would be um, you know, great for a house of, of this era. Mm -hmm. As you can see, there's a lot of custom millwork in the house, there's going to see a lot of cabinetry. For that we had to have a very skilled carpenter and one of the features that I feel best about in this home restoration is that we provided a lot of work for skilled carpenters to come in and do their thing, preserving traditional crafts. Mm -hmm. And just to reciprocate a little bit, it was just a tremendous pleasure and joy working for Stuart and Linda Herman who were very gracious and patient throughout the project because we encountered a lot of uh, special head scratching problems that <laughs> we had to, and Mark too, is, that is very knowledgeable and very easy going. To, and that helps a lot when you're working on any project, is to have good clients. Any other lessons learned or? Well, one of the challenges was due to the thickness of the walls, we had to uh, extend the window jams, which if you can get a shot of too. Mm -hmm. And so keeping those square and tight, uh, was a challenge. Well, and also we wanted to keep the traditional design of the uh, the window trimmings and the door trim, and to do that required a fair amount of creative um, intersecting. You can see there are a lot of angles that are not right. Uh, for example, for the bay window, these are not obviously 90 degree angles. A lot of specialized cutting and fitting. Adding that thickness on the walls. Um, you know, adding that insulation on the outside. We'll get into those details a little bit later, but one of the things uh, aesthetically that it does is it uh, gives a, a greater sense of volume in the home, and uh, so we were able to do this without actually um, compromising on the existing footprint, and mm -hmm. on an older home like this, you know, that, that square footage is at a premium. Um, and then every window 
is it's like a built-in. I mean, so you've got built-in shelves, so it really adds to the to the character of the home as well. So there's a real opportunity there that we were able to take advantage of. Right. I might also just point out on the remodeling side of it, you touched on this that um, you know from a uh, sustainability standpoint, um, remodeling is also really good for the economy. I mean, it's it's one of those things where um, we're shifting more dollars from buying new materials to mm. employing craftspeople. Mm. And you know, in a, in a time when we're trying to employ um, uh, you know, more and more people and, and, uh, and think about job creation, mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's a really a strong kind of strategy that way that mm -hmm. I think should be embraced even more and is, is really kind of undervalued. Mm -hmm. Now someone might think, um, you know, right, just general first cost, right, of shifting from purchasing new stuff to putting that labor. Do you see any besides the benefits do you, do you see a comparison there or? yeah well so that's um, sort of the point is that in a lot of times uh, people are quick to um, tear something down and throw it away and build new if mm -hmm. they can mm -hmm. and the comment is well I could build something new for that same cost mm -hmm. but um, my take on it is that there's a lot of we've got a, a, a tremendous amount of existing housing stock mm -hmm. and we can't be throwing all that away so why not actually shift that mindset from mm -hmm. Hey, I could remodel that and and cherish and preserve that and really enhance and, and take advantage of of what's already there mm -hmm. for the same cost. Mm -hmm. For example, the flooring that we'll see upstairs, the maple flooring, that was pulled out of three houses that were about to be demolished and then installed here and then refinished. Mm -hmm. It looks new, and in fact, it, the the flooring spans a, a time span of a hundred years, and you can't even tell the difference. It looks brand new, mm -hmm. um, and it was. Uh, and the advantage is also this old flooring, it's tight, it's never going to shrink. So I think there's a decided advantage in using that kind of recycled material where you can. Right. And to, to have this kind of character and detail to build new, I mean, that's incredibly expensive as well. So, I mean, there's, uh, to, to be able to, again, preserve and reuse uh, the, the kind of um, millwork and quality that uh, was, you know, uh, done 100 years ago, um, that's, uh, you know, it's really hard to replicate that today for the same cost. So. Now notice in the redesign of the house, we wanted to have flow. You can see it goes all the way through front to back, yet we actually, each room is defined by its own cove ceiling, and then there are also other, these semi-dividers, a pair of columns here, and then here we have one of, an old pocket door that was recovered from the uh, another part of the house. And there we have yet another arch. Mm -hmm. So we get both the, the, the sweep all the way through, which is very good for the lighting, but at the same time we get this definition of each separate room. Long views as well. So, you know, your sense of space in a house is really about your views. And so we thought about um, diagonal views. And again, that, that having it open that you can really see through beautiful windows out to the east, um, really celebrating that light coming in, morning light, beautiful sunroom there. And see, there is no compromise on appearance here. And one of the remarkable things about this house is that even though that it is net positive, it saves a lot of energy and it produces a lot of energy, you can't see this. The, the solar panels are up on the roof. You have to go out in the street to see them, except for the ones on the garage. The insulation is invisible except for the wider window sills, which are attractive in themselves, and the geothermal system is entirely invisible. Mm -hmm. So it is possible to have a, a sustainable house with no compromise in appearance. Mm -hmm. Speaking of insulation, you got a little model for us here to go over? Yes. Take All us right. behind the walls. Right. This is a cross section. Starting from the inside, we have this special drywall that absorbs formaldehyde uh, for 10 years, apparently. We need this because the house is exceedingly tight. It's five times tighter than what code requires. Then we have the old wall, which is two by fours. Uh, we just, just left that, including the fiberglass insulation, just left that in place. And we insulated the exterior, which we did by first putting on a layer of OSB, um, just to provide a smooth surface. And then, on top of that, putting some ice and water from 3M, a special form here that can be applied even in 20 below, mm -hmm. which is actually the way ours got applied. Mm -hmm. Jeff can speak to that. <laughs> putting, putting this, uh, because the whole, the work on the house was done in the middle of winter. 
Um, and on top of that, we have about seven and a half inches of EPS. EPS is expanded polystyrene, um, which is uh, is good insulator, and there's no thermal bridging because mm. this is continuous wrap all the way around the house. Then outside of that, there is five eighths inch plywood for strength. Um, all of this uh, uh, assembly, by the way, is supported by joist extensions, so it carries the whole weight. Outside of that, we have a layer of Tyvek uh, for wind protection, and uh, then furring strips, and then the siding, which is uh, just a standard siding. So the idea, uh, an old-fashioned design, which we achieve by ripping modern siding in half. Um, but the idea here is to have the exterior of the house, when you look at it, it looks just as it did, it's just a foot wider in all dimensions. And we preserve the 60-40 insulation inside versus outside the, um, the uh, moisture barrier in order to, uh, to prevent the, the buildup of moisture in the wall or on the inside of the house. And in fact, we had zero condensation in the house the whole winter long. Hmm. You can see Stuart has learned a tremendous amount about building science <laughs> over the course of this project. It's really great. This actually is also um, uh, known as a persist method of wall assembly. Um, some of the viewers might know of that method and, and be interested to know that. And um, uh, it's, yeah. it's Canadian, isn't it? By yeah, the convention. Mm -hmm. um, and that's there's a, um, a more kind of literature coming out of Canada on that, and and there's. Um, uh, another aspect of that, just on a, on a broad spectrum, is that when you do high performance walls, um, it's really important to get the assembly correct because they're less forgiving. And so, I mean, it's important for us to be doing high performance like this, but also be do, to be doing it in a, in a way that's correct so that we're not mm -hmm. getting durability issues, mold, rot, moisture issues. So mm -hmm. a lot of people um, just on the surface have the, um, the perception that, you know, tight house that's, you know, we're building houses now too tight, that's, that's not good. Well, uh, it's good to do it. It's good to build tight and ventilate right mm -hmm. and do the building science correctly so that that wall can dry out mm -hmm. uh, in both directions. Speaking of tightness, what's the air changes on this house? Uh, it's 0 0.05. Well, the air changes, um, uh, we measure it in terms of um, uh, relative to surface area. Uh, of the wall, so we're 0.05 mm -hmm. CFM per square foot of wall surface, mm -hmm. and uh, as an overall air change, I think it's like uh, 0.6. Wow, mm -hmm. passive house standard almost. Yeah, yeah. And yeah well, it, is. it meets a passive house standard in terms of air tightness. Right, and while we're on the numbers, this wall assembly is uh, R40, mm -hmm. and then the roof is R80. Right. Yeah, good. Uh, maybe just back to the flow a little bit again. Um, you know, so we opened up um, the the main level here to really kind of uh, make it much more functional for um, kind of modern living. And um, there's a I don't know if it's possible to get over and kind of see on the, the floor plan here. We can just show you really quick with a diagram uh, what um, some of the changes were and the kind of the before and after. Okay, that's so we can do it that way. Perfect. Okay, so on the left-hand side here are uh, the before diagrams, and on the right side are the after. So main level and upper level before, main level and upper level after. Uh, you can see um, the main entry here. There was this bump out, a very tight entry originally. You came into this kind of music room office mm -hmm. space, parlor off to the side, um, and then a uh, tiny little kitchen, dead-ended, stair going upstairs that you know doesn't even meet today's code. It was uh, really steep and narrow. Um, and uh, um, on the upper level then, really broken up, it was uh, uh, three bedrooms, a big master bedroom and, and two other bedrooms. And uh, um, what we did to change it was that we, we uh, improved the entry. So you come into a gracious entry, as you saw over there, it's much more open now. We moved the stair and uh, made a much wider, open, gracious stair, so that also supports um, uh, aging in place, so this stair could accommodate a lift in the future if that ever became mm -hmm. necessary. I uh, would open up the whole floor plan here, so now a much larger kitchen with diagonal views, as I said, in the family room, the sunroom, uh, and the flow is all the way around here. So the kitchen is open now, so mm -hmm. you can flow all the way around. Um, that makes the um, the uh, you know the functionality of this old house so much better. Uh, there's also then um, on the upper level here, we added a bedroom actually. So um, uh, 
we're able to remove the chimney because we don't need that on this house anymore with our geothermal system. And then we're able to make the circulation um, down the, the center of the hallway, uh, center of the house on the upper level, which that is a much more efficient mm -hmm. layout as well to have rooms um, loaded off the mm -hmm. off a center corridor like that. And, so, and, and like when the chimney removal, besides opening it up, you reduce what thermal bridging, potential water, air leaks, right? Exactly. Yeah, that was a huge, a huge performance benefit there for um, both of those reasons. I mean, mm -hmm. it already had you know water leaking and and things, so that was to just remove that. Um, also, then we don't have that penetration for our solar mm -hmm. up on our roof, uh, so there was a lot of benefits to having that gone. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, the chimney was in an area where we um, still have a mechanical chase, mm -hmm. so. We took advantage of that to run some of the new mechanicals as well. Oh, one other thing on the diagram here is you can see the thickness of the wall. So the, the really heavy, dark poche that's on these diagrams, that's the original walls. And then the, the lighter, thick shading on the outside, that's the added insulation and thickness that we added to mm -hmm. do this persist method. Mm. That's the picture. This is the kitchen. And you can just, I'll drop it and then you can just see behind yeah. me to see what it looks like now. Is that, are we aimed properly? Mm -hmm. All right, you see the, the old kitchen was about half the size of the current kitchen. We've opened and this, that view is actually the same view we're looking at right, right. now. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the kitchen. Well, we wanted to have lots of cabinet space. Um, we wanted, in light of the fact that my wife and I are both retired, we wanted to be ready for the future. So all of the lower cabinets are pull-outs, which makes it a lot easier for mm -hmm. bending and, and lifting. Mm -hmm. Then we also have pull-outs of this sort. So we have all in a row. And then very cleverly, here, this is the laundry chute. If you get close to that, you can see the shallow shelves there. Shallow shelves as opposed to the pull-outs. And you can see this is where we managed to wedge in the um, laundry chute, mm -hmm. the second floor. The overall layout, it just appears to be some more pantry space, but um, able to tuck that in. So aesthetically, really make that uh, fit in nicely. Those that, deep pullouts also um, do a great job of being able to access. Pantries right. um, are notorious for having things get lost in the back. Right. But these kinds of pull-out pantries are great because um, when you pull them out, you can access everything. Everything in the back. Another thing we did was we, we love wooden flooring. Uh, my wife really wanted a wood floor in the kitchen, but I like linoleum. And so we bought this. <laughs> and we wanted to avoid vinyl or oil-based um, products, so we, we bought the Old, good old-fashioned uh, linoleum, it's actually called marmoleum. Very tough, very durable, very easy to clean. Mm -hmm. Another feature that makes life easier. Right. Oh, the counters. And the counters, uh, we tried, we wanted to locally source as much as we could. So, for example, the, the woodwork is all local yellow birch, and the flooring is all local maple and birch. Uh, but the countertop was even possible also. This is... Cambria countertop from Quartz that is mined in Canada. Hmm. Apparently all other uh, countertop materials, uh, the Quartzes come from overseas. So once again, trying to keep it as local as possible. This countertop is extremely durable, as you mentioned. One of the things that's nice is that it does not need to be sealed no. uh, periodically. And just wiped off. Um, stove induction range, the most efficient kind that is out there. Mm -hmm. um, and every appliance that we've had, we've tried to get efficient ones in order to uh, keep down our energy consumption. Mm -hmm. To have more room for cabinets um, on this wall, we just, uh, rather than have uh, uh, larger windows to this, mm -hmm. and again, this is facing north, so there's not um, a, a great view. I mean, we've got another house close by. We tuck some uh, windows into the backsplash here, and so they also, as you can see, with the very deep, uh, window well there, they serve as um, great little shelves for um, uh, both functional and, and uh, display in the kitchen. Now as part of our energy conservation, we wanted to have as few penetrations through the outer wall as possible. One of them that we had to have was a range hood, mm -hmm. uh, which poses a problem for a very tight house because you have to have makeup air to come in to compensate for what you have just blown out through the range hood. 
So what Mark designed was an arrangement where makeup air comes in by the foundation, and goes down through the laundry room, and then comes up past the refrigerator, um, and thus it cools the coils of the refrigerator more efficiently. And you've got a supply up here? Okay, now this is, uh, no, the supplies for this are down there oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, in the floor. This is the vent for the, uh, the duct for the uh, energy recovery ventilator, the okay. ERV. So it takes the air from the kitchen, also from all the bathrooms, and runs it out through a heat exchanger out mm -hmm. of the house. When we get down to the mechanical room, you'll be able to see that unit, and uh, uh, Jason will be able to tell you a little bit more about all the details on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, I think that's it for the first floor. We do the bathroom, too? Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, all right. Back to the toilet. <laughs> oh, another thing, uh, space saver on the first floor. Do you want to catch this? Yeah. All the doors on the first floor are pocket doors. Uh, Save space in contrast to swing doors. Mm -hmm. uh, here's another one, different motif in our mudroom. And in this bathroom, another space saver we have is uh, the toilet. It is a wall mounted toilet, which makes cleaning easier on the floor. But one problem with mall-mounted toilets is what do you do with the tank? Mm -hmm. And so this is a, a Toto toilet where the tank is in the wall. And uh, so we, the footprint of the toilet is much shorter. It's just like a regular toilet. Um, and then if there's anything that breaks in the tank, everything that needs to be accessed can be accessed through this panel. Mm -hmm. um, so most, most bathrooms have an advanced, you know, bath fan that you can see in a home like this, but tell us what we're looking at. Um, okay, here. here's, the, here's the vent for the bathroom, mm -hmm. and if you swing around this way, what you can see is a switch, so that if this bathroom is used on the way out, we just simply turn the switch, and that will activate uh, the ERV to mm -hmm. start pulling air right out of that. Mm -hmm. There, you can hear it. Now it's, it's been activated. Yep. So it works just like people would expect with a bath fan, you got to switch to turn on the bath fan and to if you've got you know, higher <clears throat> levels of moisture or odor mm -hmm. in a particular bathroom and you want to you know, turn on the fan to, uh, mm -hmm. to move that out more quickly, uh, this just does it in a much more energy efficient way. Right, and you remove that extra penetration, extra expense, right? Of... Yep, yeah, rather than have another penetration for every one of those, and um, you know, bath fans are uh, considered an exhaust-only system, mm -hmm. and so if you think about it, that air that's going out has to be coming in somewhere, um, and that air that's coming in has not been not been conditioned. So all this air that you've already paid to uh, condition and mm -hmm. dehumidify in the summer or heat in the winter time, uh, you know, bath fans are just pulling that out 100%. Whereas mm -hmm. the air exchanger is you know recovering probably uh, two thirds of mm -hmm. that heat energy and uh, some of the moisture to help kind of keep a balance in the house. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, let's go to the utility room. We can see the heart of the system. Jason, this is your time to shine, I think. <laughs> Wider, more, more comfortable stair going down to the lower level than there ever was. You mentioned something about the challenges with the... Oh, yes, one challenge we had with the exterior wall here was in order to, to, to support the, uh, the, ex, the, you know, the new wall on the outside, we had to have extensions on the joist. But mm -hmm. here, there was no room to, no joist to tie into. Mm -hmm. So what uh, Mark and the engineer designed was a metal frame here, a very thick, heavy metal frame bolted into the foundation, which then supports the little joistlets that support, support the exterior wall. Great. What you're also seeing here is the exposed concrete. So this is the ex uh, original foundation of the house. When this project began, some previous uh, um, remodeler, homeowner, don't know, um, had uh, um, done a, an energy wall on the inside of here with um, studs and, and fiberglass insulation and um, that was performing poorly, so there's mold behind it, and, you know, moisture just kind of migrating through the wall. So really a basement like this um, wants to be able to dry to the inside unless you are, you know, going to really do a 100% new waterproofing system on the outside. And mm -hmm. so uh, um, didn't really have a great opportunity for doing that on the outside. Um, so 
and the basement didn't need to be finished. So leaving this wall exposed is really uh, great for it. And so now we're back to the uh, mm -hmm. original uh, board form. You can even see a uh, poured concrete wall. Mm -hmm. But because the floor was in bad shape, we tore it up and uh, poured a new floor over two inches of styrofoam. So uh -huh. we have some insulation in the floor as well. That's really important. Yeah. Should I talk about the dryer? Okay. Um, We've used energy conserving appliances wherever we can. Uh, this is our dryer. Looks like an ordinary dryer, but there are two features that set it apart. First of all, there is no exhaust vent, um, so there's no penetration through the outside wall, which costs us, would cost us energy. Um, and that is because it's a condensing dryer. All the moisture in the clothes goes into a little tube, a little plastic tube there, and then it just goes down through the sump and uh, into the system. Mm -hmm. All right, the other feature about this is that it's driven by a heat pump. Um, so it is much more efficient than just a straight electric dryer. As far as I know, there is only one model in the world of this uh, that we got it. It is more expensive than a regular dryer, but it performs just as well and mm -hmm. saves a lot of energy. Now that's pulling heat out of the basement, right? The heat right pump here. pulls heat out of the basement, that's yeah. right. Does that dehumidify too while it's doing that? Uh, it doesn't dehumidify the basement. Yeah, let's ask Jason <laughs> about um, the dehumidification function. Yeah. But you'll notice the temperature down here is cooler. It typically runs 65 or less. That's because we have three heat pumps operating, one for the dryer, one for the water heater, and one for the, the heating and cooling system. Real simple thing here, but anyone can do. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. All the ducts really are nice. meticulously sealed. Yeah. Yep. So it's how it's performed well. Met the Energy Star requirement for um, a duct leakage, a whole house. Um, Hot total water. duct leakage as well as, um, you know, duct leakage to the outside is is like zero. And mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it actually is 10 CFM, something like that. It's just ridiculously low um, uh, with that whole air sealing and insulation system that was done. And all the ducts are, you know, internal. There's no ducts mm -hmm. in any exterior walls or anything mm -hmm. like that. So, um, and the insulated uh, water pipes too mm -hmm. you're seeing there. And Here, uh, the corner's done really well. You can see it really, that's a point where a lot of times that doesn't get done well, but right. uh, really did a lot of care to um, make all that. You might want to just notice here very quickly, this shows the kind of framing that had to be done to accommodate the exterior wall to, for the new windows. Um, so that, that we had to build boxes around for each window like that. That was Jeff again. <laughs> okay, onward. Now Jason, you take it from here, please, and explain the uh, utility room. Right. Stuart and Mark were just uh, talking about the exhaust for the bathrooms. So this is the ERV system uh, that it has the exhaust point in each area. Um, when you turn the timers in the bathroom, uh, a lot of source point applications with the ERVs will draw from the all source points. What we added here was a RZL zoning system, so rather than it drawing from all exhaust points, we have individual points. So if you do the crank timer in one area, that zone damper will open and then just draw that air from that area rather than the entire house, which then you'd waste more energy. So we're kind of uh, have it concentrated on the areas that need the exhaust. Uh, we still have an, an exhaust that runs periodically, 20 minutes every hour, to give them the, the natural exhaust that we need by code uh, for the house. But then, rather than the bathroom, uh, so okay. okay, we're live again. <laughs> What's the efficiency of this um, of this system? Do you know what I'm of the ERV system, yeah, yeah. you're looking at about 75 percent efficiency okay. on, on, on this particular one. It has e uh, ECM fan motors, so this is. Ven Myers or Brones, now private label Brone here in the U.S. Um, this is their most efficient unit. Mm -hmm. If I remember, Jason, this one wasn't available when we very first started designing this project, but it came available and then we upgraded to this uh, during the course of the project. Is that, that right? That is correct, yeah. yeah. That is correct. Um, so this is the heat pump that does the conditioning for the house. So it does the forced air heating and cooling. Here again, we also have zone dampers. So he has zoning or a thermostat on his main and upper level, so he can control the climates if he's not using the upper stair, upstairs. He can uh, turn that thermostat up or down, depending upon what season you're in, so um, you're not using you know, unneeded, unneeded energy. Um, the zone system is located over here, which that's, that's just the controls. This is a Geo Comfort heat pump. Uh, the efficiencies on here depend upon first or second stage, which is a higher low, so it's a two-stage heat pump. Uh, the efficiencies will vary. 
uh, low speed efficiencies, you're looking at a, a COP of nearly 5.0, which mm -hmm. equivalents to 500% efficiency. Um, so we put the most efficient unit in here that GeoComfort makes. Obviously, we want to conserve the, the most amount of energies to, to achieve that actually net positive in this case. Um, this is also a air source water heater, um, uh, air, air source heat pump that does uh, whole, uh, hot water generation for the house. And then behind that, we have a storage tank for the domestic hot water. So whenever the heat pump is running and heating or air conditioning, we're actually providing hot water for the home. Um, long enough runtime, we'll heat that water in that tank up to 130 degrees, so this unit won't kick in. So we're taking advantage of um, that energy that would, in, in air, air conditioning, for example, that would normally get rejected out into the loop field, we're actually mm -hmm. putting directly into that water heater, which is absolutely free hot water for the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, in the winter, we're taking a little bit of the heat uh, from the home, um, but there again, we're looking at, you know, 500% efficiency, uh, maybe a little bit less in some cases, and and heating that mm. preheating for the domestic hot water. Yeah, so I know some homes um, would geo use all the what, D superheater, right? All yep. hot water. Is there any reason this one kind of added the um, the heat pump water heater? Yeah, well, the to to do 100% of your domestic hot water with a D superheater. Uh, Cost-wise, isn't practical. Okay. Uh, you, you're best taking advantage of, of the desuperheater and doing as much hot water as possible. And then in this case, just let the let the air source heat pump take over and finish it off per mm -hmm. se. Mm -hmm. So even if we don't have a long enough runtime, we can heat that water up to 90 degrees mm -hmm. uh, rather than the 50 degree entering water temperature. It's all the less mm -hmm. this unit has to. Mm -hmm. um, so that's better than that. Mm. Um, and you can see the, the pump on the wall. That's actually the circulation pump for the loop field. There again, that is an ECM pump. Uh, that circulates water to and from the ground loop. Uh, there's a four ton ground loop, or what we size as a four ton, so it's a oversized loop field for the capacity of the unit. The benefit of that is we're keeping the water temperatures higher, which there adds even more efficiency to the to the standard efficiency rating of the heat pump. Since, since these are rated at 32 degree entering water temperature, if we can maintain 35 to 40 degrees, that actually increases our COPs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so did, when you explored uh, different HVAC systems, uh, I know some projects we've seen like this are actually using um, mini splits. Um, was that looked at or compared against GEO and all? What's yeah, I mean, holistically, we looked at that. I mean, mm -hmm. we, um, from a high level, we said right from the beginning, we need to, you know, employ heat pump te technology as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And, um, but the, you know, a mini split um, just is going to be not as integrated with the duct work. Mm -hmm. um, you've got units sitting outside. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got a tight lot here. So one of the things that's really nice about the, the ground source system is that when we go outside, you'll just see it's a clean lot. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's very tight footprint here. We have a small backyard. Um, and uh, so, but there's there's no outdoor condenser units, anything mm -hmm. like that, hanging mm -hmm. on the house, standing outside the house, things like that. Um, so there's a, there are a number of reasons that way that uh, this really seemed to make the most sense, and and just the extreme efficiency of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's comfortable. Uh, it's, qu it's quite comfortable. <laughs> yeah. And I, one other feature of the comfort here, this is more the plumbing than the HVAC. Uh, but you see that little recirculation pump. Mm -hmm. What it does is keep the hot water moving in a loop. And so that whenever we turn on any of the faucets, this is one of my wife's insistences that we have hot water instantly in contrast to our last old house. And by George, within three seconds, we have hot water out of any faucet. And even with low flow devices, right? And even with low flow devices. Mm -hmm. Another aspect of that is that that is um, uh, tied into a motion sensor. So when we go back up to the bathroom, we might point that out. Yeah. Um, so it's not just running all day, which would be you know not as energy efficient. Um, there's motion sensors in each of the bathrooms. So when you go into the bathroom, it triggers this thing on. So by the time you uh, use that faucet, it's got the hot water there. So it's really the best of both worlds. Okay. Do this. Yeah. So we've got two um, solar arrays, one on the house and one on the garage. So therefore we installed two inverters. There's one here is 11.4 kilowatt inverter and on the garage, in the garage is a 3.8 kilowatt inverter. Um, so this shows the production for this inverter here daily, monthly. So far they've produced nine kilowatt hours. Um, 
It's been installed for almost a year now. So we've got 12 megawatt hours, almost 13 for the year. So that's excellent. And um, these inverters have optimizers under each panel, so we can monitor the panels per panel. Great. See how each one's performing. Cool. Well, we'll head up soon and go talk about the solar and yeah. get something. We want this house to be a teaching device, and so we've contracted for an outfit uh, called Center for Energy and Environment to come in and monitor heat flow through the walls at three levels here on the first floor wall and then up in the attic uh, to gain a sense of, uh, on a residential system with this Brazil system, how well it performs. Mm. Do you measure moisture as well? This doesn't measure moisture. This measures uh, heat flux, they mm. say. So the heat flow through the wall. So this will be... Um, uh, rather than a theoretical, um, you know, we've got you know, so much insulation R value in the wall, they'll be able to actually calculate the R value of the wall from um, actual heat transfer through it. And, and that's important because the Persist system is relatively unfamiliar in the U.S., um, and certainly in this region, and also because we have a novel system for insulating the basement. Uh, what we did was have people come in, it's called cocoon, where they simply dug a four inch trench the whole way down, sucked out the dirt, and then filled it with two inches of foam and then another two inches of squirted in foam. So we get R30 without tearing up the flower beds. Oh, so you do have oxalation out there on right. the exterior. We do. If you want to see a couple of images, I don't know if you can zoom in on this. I can. This is cool. um, their excavating it. Um, mm -hmm. I say it's surgical because they come in and they just excavate a trench that's about four or six inches wide mm -hmm. um, with a big vacuvator truck and a, mm -hmm. and a pressure, um, high pressure water. And then once that trench is there, um, then they uh, put in a little poly towards the soil, um, a layer of EPS insulation, and then a, a special formulation of a closed cell mm -hmm. um, expanded or um, uh, closed cell spray foam. Mm -hmm. And so that does adhere to the outside of the foundation wall and uh, gives a lot of um, uh, moisture protection, but it's not, you know, really being uh, touted as 100% waterproof because they're not, you know, there might be some imperfections down below grade. But mm -hmm. we found that it really did uh, improve the, um, the performance down here, really dried things up. And uh, um, then there's the uh, close-up of that um, you know the foam added up to grade, mm -hmm. is and there's the, was their that the original siding, or is that with your extra wall? Uh, this is the original siding. Oh, so okay. So this the wall's was, not out here. Correct. Okay. Yep. So this is one of the first things that was done. Is that uh, came in and, and um, uh, excavated that, and uh, there's their big vacuvator truck. Um, uh, so it just looks like mm -hmm. one of these trucks that they use to clean out the sewers, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. um, now, is there uh, is that foam continuing under the slab as well, or what's under the slab here? Um, the part of the basement that uh, we replaced the slab, mm. then there we took the opportunity to put in a couple inches of uh, expanded polystyrene also. Okay. And um, uh, the part of the basement that had existing slab, that is remained as is. Mm -hmm. um, we're assuming no insulation under that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, this house, because of its thick foundation wall, it doesn't have footings, as you think about, like a wide footing mm -hmm. and a narrower foundation wall. Mm -hmm. Uh, the wall itself is um, about 12 to 16 inches thick, mm -hmm. and so um, that in and of itself is the, the footing. So mm -hmm. that uh, exterior insulation went down to the bottom of that. Mm -hmm. You enjoy, you guys do that all right? Is that something you normally do on your renovations or? Uh, in some of the renovations, yeah. yes, we do, but not every project. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a fairly it's new a system. Very, very special project this mm -hmm. yeah. for us. Very unique project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that system, and to be you know to be kind of um, uh, uh, complete information on that system, it works really well um, if you have soils that don't collapse easy. So if you had sandy soil, that wouldn't work because mm -hmm. you know they couldn't do that trench. Um, and uh, but it's it's great um, opportunity for you don't have to like tear up the flower beds. Mm -hmm. um, you know you could do that on an existing house, and they could just come in and, and do that kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. So there's been a few houses and and. Uh, Hopefully more. Hopefully mm -hmm. more. <laughs> Someone watching today will do the next one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Heading up. Uh, okay, I'll join you in a second. <laughs> Thank you.
Who says we're waiting to go outside or to go upstairs first, I guess, right? We'll go upstairs yep. next. Okay. Um, Hi. You. <laughs> this is your house. We know. <laughs> All right. Should we go up or do you want yeah, to? Yeah, why don't you, you, okay. if you want to help pick us up. Okay, yeah, come on up. So this is the new stair, of course. Um, and you can see it's quite wide. Uh, that was um, just uh, something that uh, really helps with the flow again and um, the ability for being able to, in the future, add a stair lift if uh, there's a need for aging in place. Mm. Um, the upper flight is even wider than that, that first flight, and part of that is because we're up above the foundation now, and so we can, we can expand even further here. Um, Tell me about the design of these windows. Yeah, great question. These, were, uh, these are off-the-shelf Anderson windows, but Mark has, had developed this design for Anderson uh, Queen Anne drill work and which is authentic to the era just before this house was built, late 19th century. Mm -hmm. And we thought it would just add a wonderful touch, and we, indeed we just get lots of comments, mm -hmm. people asking about these grillwork windows. Now, do you lose any efficiency doing that? Or? No, because we didn't, they don't have um, a spacer between the glass, mm -hmm. so it's not, a, it's not a true divided light, it's a simulated divided light. Mm -hmm. So that triple pane glass um, really performs well, and. Uh, uh, we did work with Anderson um, to mm -hmm. get the right coatings because mm -hmm. you can have you know different um, different types of low E coating, mm -hmm. and uh, so we did some different modeling to see what was going to perform the best, and and uh, it was great. They they worked uh, closely with us to um, you know help us um, get the one that was going to perform the best on an annual basis. So and we have different coating uh, combinations on different sides of the house. All right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. On the north side, we've got uh, um, you know it's got a, a, a higher um, a coating on it that um, has a, so it gives a, the, the window a better performance. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the south side, for holding in heat, right? Yeah. So on the on the south and the east and the west, um, we've got uh, ones that have a higher solar heat gain coefficient. Right. So okay. um, even though we don't have a great opportunity in this house and tight neighborhood for passive solar, take advantage of it as mm -hmm. we can. Mm -hmm. um, one other thing I'll just point out. So you notice this one is operable, um, and. Uh, we have um, strategically placed operable windows and fixed windows and double hung windows uh, both for the aesthetic as well as cross ventilation. So where we could, um, we have uh, fixed windows and uh, right behind you, you can see that's a fixed one. Yep. Uh, didn't need that for ventilation. And if you're able to get a view of the ones across the room over there, there's a grouping of three and you can see just the center one mm -hmm. is operable. So um, fixed windows are, um, better performing because mm. they're just they're not going to leak as much air um, they're also less costly because mm. there's less hardware so that's really a win-win strategy so we've got one operable over there operable here so we can get cross ventilation as we want and uh, really um, have just the windows needed to well, operate actually we found that the ERV is so effective in bringing fresh air in that we <laughs> we only open the windows on the shoulder seasons when we want to just turn off the heating system altogether to mm -hmm. save energy. So when well, you kind of cool the house down at night sometimes, is we've, that, been, we've yeah. been doing that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now it's, it's not. Nice. So, it's been so hot; it hasn't worked so well. But mm -hmm. in May and June, we did that. Yeah. yeah. All right, upstairs. Oh, don't forget the dog. Pretty, you silly beast. The keepers of the peace. We had a very, very small space to work with for this bathroom and decided to devote it to a good sized shower. Uh, once again, we have the wall mounted toilet to save space and uh, subway tile here finishing it. General beach theme. And then we have this not frosted glass, it's a pattern glass that is uh, a lot more attractive than just having glass block. Mm -hmm. Mark, anything special behind the shower and tub surround to help with moisture? Yeah, there's a, um, a waterproofing system mm -hmm. behind there. Um, and uh, so really a lot of attention to the detail to make sure that uh, there's not going to be any water leakage into the assemblies behind for durability, for mm -hmm. sure. Yep. A waterproofing goes up. Um, there's a, a general waterproofing, um, and then we have the, you know, the robust waterproofing that would be underneath the floor come all the way up, I think, to like five or six feet. Mm -hmm. If you're able to get a close shot here, too, this is that uh, motion sensor that mm -hmm. I had mentioned. So this is 
um, you know, uh, turning on the hot water circulation. Um, the minute we walked in here, it turned on that pump to start circulating hot water. Hmm. All right. Here we have tried to keep, we have succeeded, I guess, in keeping the old millwork. Now, the millwork is 100 years old, it's yellow birch, and it had a kind of a grungy varnish on it. And so I took it out, stripped it, stained it, and refinished it, and then the carpenters put it back in. Not in the original spots, they simply cut and refitted as they could. Um, so we saved 14 doors out of the old house. We saved the dog out of the old house. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see even here, we reconstituted, uh, that had been an outlet, so we put in a patch because we wanted to keep as much as we could. Now the other feature of this is the flooring. This is the recycled maple flooring I mentioned before. It came out of three houses in St. Paul and Wyzetta. It ranges in age from 1875 to 1990. Um, and honestly, you can't tell the difference. This is the 1875 stuff here, and that's the 1990 stuff over there. But the, the, the great idea of using this stuff is that it is, it, it is pre-shrunk. So when you take it out, you have to pull out all the nails, you have to clean it, but when the installer puts it in and gets it really tight, you know it's not going to shrink and open up anymore. Mm -hmm. So I am, I've gotten more excited about this stuff, although, frankly, it's a lot of work. <laughs> but it's free. Here's our laundry chute. Never have a two-story house without a laundry chute. <laughs> All right, another heat-saving measure that we did. <clears throat> oh, I'm without the picture. I should find that on the picture. This used to be a cathedral ceiling here in the master bedroom, and it was a waste of heat. All the heat that was rising up and lost in the ceiling. So what we did was have the carpenters drop the ceiling, make a barrel vault with bendable sheetrock backed by two by four stringers the whole way, so it's very sturdy. Um, and that way we keep the heat down, and it's, it's as much ceiling as we need, and then we were able to center it on that uh, Anderson window. Oh, for us. yeah, thank you. Um, this, I will pull out the picture of the... Ah, here it is. This, is. this is what it used to look like. You can see the cathedral ceiling that went up and over like that. Um, and so we tore all of this out and then put in a barrel vault, which is sort of like that. And the coves up top are illuminated. So we get some nice indirect lighting, which is good for the mood when the mood hits. <laughs> and um, another feature, because we extended the house nine feet, we were able to add two walk-in closets, eight feet by six feet, which were perfectly large enough to accommodate. We simply got a lot of uh, wardrobes from uh, Ikea to fill the spaces, mm -hmm. and lots of room to store all of our clothes. Um, last thing is the bathroom. This bathroom is done in a Victorian theme, traditional hex tile, uh, wooden wainscoting, subway tile. It's meant to look Victorian of the era when this house was built. Notice the accommodations for aging. Once again, we are just trying to be prepared. Um, all of our drawers are soft clothes. Um, uh, our rear entry is easily going to be rampable. We can put a ramp in. So we, we tried to think ahead with Mark's help mm -hmm. to think about how can we live in this house when we're in our 70s and our 80s, maybe even our 90s. Mm -hmm. And this bathroom too, even up here, is, is handled by the ERV system. There's the ERV once again. I love to turn these things on. Mm -hmm. It'll come on in just a second. Mm -hmm. We also have in-floor heating here, which mm -hmm. we've, I haven't figured out how to program it yet, but it's there. Mm -hmm. That's a comfort thing. So it's for toasty toes. In Florida. Mm -hmm. right. And then we also have, this is the switch that turns on the recirculation system to guarantee that if you need to, uh, it operates automatically when you walk into the bathroom, the recirculation system turns on and we'll have bingo, ah, hot water right away. <laughs> uh, and how long does that stay on once it detects you? Like just... 
Uh, I think it's like uh, um, 10 or 20 minutes. Yeah, it's oh, just yeah, a, wow. And you can set that in the, right, the right, thermostat right. as well, or in that motion detector. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Let's go outside. All right. Dogs, you can come with us. <coughs> Essential part of living in an old house when you're trying to save energy is you always turn off the lights. <laughs> Do you want to see the e-gauge? Yeah, where is that at? That's up, I'm sorry, oh, yeah, that's upstairs. Let's take a look at your energy yeah. usage. Okay. Gives me another opportunity. Oh, it gives Andre an opportunity to turn up the lights. Very good. <laughs> okay. This is now real time. When it pops up, it'll show what's happening right now. Come on. It's important to keep your computer off, right? To save energy, right? <laughs> Sleeping. <That's it. laughs> oh, shoot. I just lost it. Okay. Uh, what I'm going to do is toggle everything on there. And I'll drop it down to one day. Now, what you're going to see in green is the solar production. This is, this is yesterday's production. We had a lot of cloudiness blowing in and out. This is overnight. This is what we bought from Excel. So it's when it's pink shaded like that, that's electricity we bought, and you can see the operation of our mm -hmm. cooling system, which peaks at about, and this is, oh, this is our car charging right here. That draws about two kilowatts, and then we have another two kilowatts for the brief intervals that the geothermal system, the cooling system comes on. Now, here we are ramping up. This is 6 a.m., this is 9 a.m., and currently it's about 10 o'clock in the morning. You can see that the solar is ramping up very fast, mm -hmm. and it's going to get all the way up to about 15 kilowatts uh, during the day, and then we're going to have a nice big bell-shaped curve while the consumption stays all the way down here, and even this consumption now is simply drawn off of the solar production. So we're not buying any power from Excel at this point, and we won't until about 8 o'clock tonight. And I'm, you know, if you can imagine, this is, shows you if we had constant sunlight here rather than clouds, you can see what the bell-shaped curve looks like and how, how much greater it is than, um, than the consumption. In fact, in the summer, we're, draw, we're using about one-tenth of all the power that we create. In the winter, we use about twice as much power as we generate. But overall, it still comes out net positive. Mm. Do you have data going back? How far back do you have on this? All the way to August okay. of 2016. So we're coming up to the one-year mark. Are you able uh, to see the... Uh... Let me show you the solar collection. This e-gauge system just got installed and up and running uh, a month ago. Is that what it was, Stuart? Uh, yeah, the e-gauge has been operating just a month. Oh, so you don't have that full way back to... No, but what I can, I can show you the solar uh, production... Right. The overall solar system has been installed and, and operating for, for about a year, year. Mm -hmm. and they also have um, some uh, okay. production graphs. So now this is July, so July 1st all the way to July 24th, and you can see typically yesterday we hit 93 kilowatt hours. On a bad day, you know, we're getting down less than 40 if it's too cloudy. That was a very cloudy day. That would be that. Uh, in the winter, on the max, we'll get maybe 25 kilowatt hours. On a cloudy day, we'll get about five. So there's great seasonal variation. I'm wondering if I can, okay, here I can get the whole year. There we go. You can see from January, February, from February on, it's pretty good. It's, it's dramatic, the increase that occurs, even though February was not a terribly sunny month. Neither was March or April. We had a lot of clouds this year. But... Uh, we're still producing very nicely, and you can see July mm. will probably peak up around two and a half megawatts hours, um, and then we'll start declining in uh, in August and September. I think we'll start on our way down in terms of overall production. 
It's uh, mainly the function, I think it's the degree of cloudiness that counts more than the sun angle. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been my experience here, but, um, but both obviously are really important. Great. Okay. Laura's still here? Is it? Yep. Laura's. I can see you ready. I'll talk about. Oh, the solar. Exterior solar. Hi. <laughs> panels all together. Um, they are LGs, uh, 315 watts a piece, so there's 17 kilowatts all together. Um, we got 42 on the house, I think, and well, 12 on the garage. 12 yeah. on the garage. So there they are. Um, like I said before, they each have optimizers under each one, so we can monitor the production performance of each panel. And then there's another inverter inside the garage. So we trenched over to the house and then to the other inverter and to the meter. Mm -hmm. So it feeds all into Excel Energy, our local utility. And then um, Stuart gets, gets a reduced electric bill and he gets a incentive credit. He'll get a check once a year. It probably hasn't gotten his check yet. But it comes in February, the, the solar rewards solar check. Rewards but check but we get a monthly February. check as well. Right. Like a monthly, do you get a monthly check as yes, well? Yes, yes. Okay, so not just a bill credit, zero. No, they, they send a check. Oh, yeah, you're and definitely that's net, net positive. That's, yeah. that's, that's for the net metering. metering. Okay. That is just, the, yeah. they're paying us the regular rate for the solar power, and then the solar rewards is what they pay us for buying the attribute of the right. solar. Right, yeah. yeah. Well, that's cool. Most people so, just get a credit. So <laughs> you actually get, if you overproduce, they'll pay you? Oh, yes. 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 Is yeah. that a special program that you had to sign up for, get into? Is that limited? No, no that's state wow. law. That's state law. Net metering in Minnesota is state mm -hmm. law. So that's mm -hmm. one of the big pluses of... Yep. of uh, Under 40 you know. kilowatts. Mm -hmm. Right. Good and we point. get about oh. 60, 60 to $150 a month. Oh, wow. To, for, the, uh, mm -hmm. for the net exciting. metering part. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, very exciting. I love the yeah. internet check. So does this system, system have uh, microinverters or tell us what we've got, you know, in case... No, it, does, it doesn't It does have microinverters. Solar Edge is a, a main single inverter, mm -hmm. and then it uses the optimizers under each panel instead mm -hmm. of a microinverter to mitigate for shade and to show us performance of each panel. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, it makes it a little easier for us to do maintenance when we don't have inverters under every panel. We can mm -hmm. just go in the garage and fix the inverter if there's a problem with mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Now what about snow? Uh, you know, it sticks. <laughs> I was going to say, Stuart knows mm -hmm. best, because um, it, it kind of depends on the angle, but hopefully yeah. it'll, it'll slide off eventually yeah. in one big giant pile, I'm sure. Well, if it's, <laughs> if it's a typical Minnesota well below zero freeze, it'll stay for a few days. Mm -hmm. uh, but if it's a sloppy March kind of snow, it'll be off within mm -hmm. hours. Yeah. Yeah. Have you looked into those roof scrapers that just get We were way strongly up there? advised not to yep. use them. I think yeah. you told yep. me that Laura. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we advised to not use the roof scrapers. Damn we just it. advise patience. We we treasure our <laughs> we treasure our panels because these things are like three hundred and fifteen watts each yep. and they're like nineteen percent efficient. Yep. They are very productive panels and we don't want to do anything to wreck them. Yeah, mm -hmm. so. don't want to scrape them. And you know, winter is is it's poor production anyways. That's right. So you're not, not missing that much with a few days of snow. So, mm -hmm. And that's all factored into the yep. calculations, right? I mean, you want to talk about the solar shading just a little bit? I mean, yeah. that's yeah, we did an a, uh, Yep, we did a Pathfinder, um, so a solar shading report, which would show that, you know, in the morning, in the summer, this garage is going to get shade. And mm -hmm. so it shows the entire year what you're going to get in each month, at each time of day. 
and then we figure out how much it'll produce yearly mm -hmm. based on those averages. So we fi factor in the snow, we factor in the sun being low in the sky in the winter. It's just not a whole lot of production in the winter, but March to oh, probably February. November, middle February. Of February, yeah, it's really great. Up. So I'm, oh, yeah. it, it'll go all the way through October. Middle of February to October is going to be great production. Yeah, so it's really just a month or two of yeah. sadness. A lot of sadness. Yeah, it's <laughs> a it's lot painful of sadness. day after day because we will generate in December like we're lucky to get 300 kilowatts for the whole kilowatt hours for the whole month. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, which is pathetic. Mm -hmm. Right. But and so right we, now you're producing 80 kilowatt hours. Yesterday was 94. A day. And I've yeah. hit, I've had 115. Right. right. So yeah, mm -hmm. no, so we're getting a lot right. now. Mm -hmm. We make up, and that's what makes it possible. So you have to think about net positive or net zero. You have to think on an annual cycle, it's mm -hmm. not day to day. Mm -hmm annual cycle. Yeah, don't drive yourself crazy. Mm. So, sp <laughs> so, so speaking of that, I mean, tell us, Mark, a little bit about the HERS index, REM rate, how you incorporated the solar shading into yeah. that, and yeah. where that's kind of tracking at right now. Yeah, so from the beginning, I mean, one of Stuart's questions when we even started this project, is it possible to get to net zero? And then so, and if not, you know, we're not so sure we might want to do this. So <laughs> we did um, some analysis, ballparking, right from the beginning, um, had IPS come out and do that solar shading analysis, so we could have a good idea from the very beginning what was the potential production on the site and then compare that to uh, what we expected for the consumption in utilizing heat pump technology as much as possible and and uh, we used uh, a REM uh, for that, a REM rate, REM design and um, and came up with uh, you know the, the analysis that yeah we could achieve it on this and so then you know we proceeded. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the HERS index right now, now that it's, it's done, we're producing and, and we've got you know, final testing and everything. Um, the HERS index is uh, looking like it's going to be negative 9. And um, uh, uh, the, the HERS um, modeling is uh, projecting about 4,000 kilowatt hours of, of uh, overproduction for the year. Um, and, uh, but since we have the electric car, that, that actually cuts into that some, even though you know, the HERS index doesn't doesn't factor in cars. Yeah, so HERS index, you don't factor in electric cars. Right. Um, but I guess tell us a little bit about where your production's at right now, how far along we are, um, and then uh, is that a fully electric car? Or? No, it's a plug-in hybrid. Okay. It uh, will run about 20, 25 miles on a charge, depending okay. on the season. Uh, it takes a couple hours to charge. Mm -hmm. uh, it draws at the rate of between one and two kilowatts. Uh, so it's a pretty hefty bump on our consumption and we're charging it every day mm -hmm. practically mm -hmm. uh, and I'll, sometimes twice a day because mm -hmm. it only takes a few hours and so I can do errands and then come mm -hmm. back and charge it again. We're currently getting 103 miles per gallon in the car <laughs> because with all the solar charging that we're doing and the nice thing is we are running it on solar energy if I charge it during the day. Um, so now what this makes for a dent in our over solar production for the month, we haven't calculated that yet. Um, we still have to get a little more software fi figured out mm -hmm. for that, but we will be able to distinguish what it takes to charge the car mm -hmm. from all the other uh, uses mm -hmm. and I, whatever that does to the HERS index or whatever, I don't know, but mm -hmm. there's no question about it. We are running net positive even with this car. Right. We're coming up on a year, right? And you're yeah, we're coming up on a there. year, yeah. And the summer's going to be the best time for you, so... Of course, yeah. we're producing ten times as much as we consume right mm -hmm. now. You've already gone through that tough winter. You've already <laughs> yeah. been through the tough now winter. You're on the, now you're coasting. <laughs> yeah, we are, we are coasting. Um, yeah. Did we talk about the, the water and the... Yeah, let's, talk, let's wrap up with the, the house design and the sustainable sites here. We're on a slope, and that's good because all the water will go that away. But we wanted to, in deference to our neighbor's wishes, um, to keep all the water on the site. And so what we designed is a system where the, drain, the downspouts go into a drain tile right here. And the drain tile goes under the lawn. And right in this area, right under here, starting two feet underground, there are what are called flow wells, which are plastic tubs about two feet in diameter, two feet high, perforated. And Mark has a picture of these things. They're buried there. The water goes in there. It seeps into the ground table, and that's that. Are you able to see that? Yeah, a little lighting's a little tough, but I think we can see it. Yeah. We can go in the garage for it. And then there's uh, the flow well assembled. 
before it's uh, put into the ground. And in the corner here, you can see that um, you, you overdig the hole and uh, uh, put a lot of free draining rock and a filter fabric to prevent that from filling up with sediment. Mm -hmm. And then um, these uh, will take um, a huge amount of the, the storm water. Mm -hmm. And like Stuart said, I think he's, there's 10 of them, so um, so far they've been managing, handling 100% of the stormwater mm -hmm. and uh, absorbing that into the ground. So um, again, being you know differential to tight neighborhoods, tight city lots where uh, most of the foundations don't have a lot of waterproofing, mm -hmm. trying to really um, you know be sensitive to running water towards the neighbor and not not impacting them as well. So mm -hmm. now, does Minneapolis have stormwater issues, stormwater incentives, or is it just you know, let's help out and keep it out of there. Yeah, so this was, uh, there's not, he's not getting an incentive for this right now. Um, uh, we're hoping to promote that yep. and um, to be, a, you know, to be a leader in that way. Right. So um, Stuart and Linda uh, came into this, um, you know, really thinking a lot about the energy. But when we started to talk a little bit about holistic mm -hmm. design, I mean, they quickly embraced that. Right. And so quickly um, mm -hmm. uh, embraced mm -hmm. the uh, certification mm -hmm. of like Green Star and uh, Lead for Homes. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, we, we incorporated those certification programs into the whole design process mm -hmm. then uh, to help make decisions, help make informed decisions and, and make sure that uh, the project is really looking at, you know, holistic mm -hmm. sustainability. Mm -hmm. Take a look. You're seeing, you know, a lot of uh, uh, you know, the exterior there um, uh, just Really, um, really a lot of charm and character uh, fitting in with uh, the aesthetic of this house and the neighborhood. These are Minis Minnesota gills. Uh, you know, <laughs> if you have a fish, it's gray, and you it opens up its gills and it's pink. Mm -hmm. So and this is this is meant to emulate that. This is like the gills of a fish. Mm -hmm. They're beautiful. Oh. So they're just uh, shellac uh, beadboard. And you can see, uh, you know, the craftsmanship too. We were talking about. Look at the corners there. How they, how they did this weave of the, of those boards rather than just a, a simple miter there. They really wove those together. So I know that was. Uh, oh, by, by Matt. A lot of Matthew detail does. there that uh, uh, you see when you get you up you close, Jeff. Did you did the corners? I'm not going to take credit for all of this. <laughs> <laughs> There's some other guys on the job. So, but yeah, we, the face. We just do what we do. We're, we're told. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Um. I'll, I'll just point out that for aesthetics, we also, it's like some houses will have conduit coming down from the solar on the outside of the house, but because mm. we could plan ahead, we ran conduit inside before um, mm -hmm. all the work was done mm -hmm. on, the, mm -hmm. on the house, so you don't have the conduits running to the electrical meter. Mm -hmm. Now, besides the um, rainwater uh, collection down here, there's we got something else going down right here, right? Yeah, the geothermal yes. loop field is also, oh, also yeah. buried yeah. in the backyard. You can't see everything. It's approximately no, it's five feet below grade. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, the, the wells are like this, this, that, that. Uh, the headers are five feet down. Yeah. So we still managed to ding one and um, when we're digging the flow wells. So that had to be, mm. you guys came out and touched yeah. that. Easy repair. Um, <laughs> vertical loops, uh, I believe these were 180 feet in depth. 250. Or 250. 250, yeah. 250 feet in depth times four. Right. Yep. So a thousand feet of heat transfer. Any specific challenges drilling in the city or this happened to be a good lot or? Um, rock in Minneapolis is oh. always a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, it takes it's, takes a little longer. Mm -hmm. um, it's about 100 feet deep I think. That's the, what the geology is around to, here. It's a bedrock. Yep. yep. And then after that, um, I believe this is a sandstone. So it wasn't too mm -hmm. difficult but mm -hmm. there are some other uh, Regulations we have to we have to concrete those those wells up to that bedrock match the formations of it which adds, adds some cost to it, but for Minneapolis itself. That's That's a challenge the bedrock typically. it took about what three or four days I think for the guys to do all the drilling to do the drilling about Correct. three or yeah. four days mm -hmm. um, And it made a huge mess. I mean, there's no point if you love your lawn you can't do geothermal. You've got to resign yourself to the fact you're going to have to redo the whole thing once it's all done. We always say relax, grass grow back. But. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. But there's, I mean, this is, you know, just to make the point, I mean, this is a really tight lot. I mean, it's about 25 feet from the house mm -hmm. to the garage, yeah. and uh, the width of the lot is 40 feet. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, a lot of people are really surprised that you could you know, have a geosystem in tight city lot. And, mm -hmm. you know, so this is a great example to show that it can be done. 
Um, but definitely ask questions up first, I mean, up front. I mean, again, one of the first things we did when we were trying to anal analyze the feasibility was can they get geo in here? And so we had mm -hmm. the, the, the drillers come out and evaluate the site and make sure that they could get a rig in here. And uh, they said, yeah, and in fact, we can get a rig in, you know, most city lots, but uh, it's always good to ask first and just make sure that... Before you uh, start drilling. Right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And power We're lines, you know, so lines. you got to, um, you know, make sure that you've got room to, to maneuver. Mm -hmm. So why don't you, before we wrap up, show us the before and after here. Oh, You've got that. <laughs> While Stuart's getting the, um, some of those photos, um, I'll show you uh, one of the front of the house. Um, I don't think he has a print out of that. If you're able to see that. Yep. So that's a before. Um, you can see enclosed porch. Uh, really kind of messy aesthetically, different kind of grill patterns, um, you know, really not inviting to the neighborhood. And um, here's a little side that's, you know, this house had a, a real um, bizarre little intersection of the porch to the house where the bay window was and little angled window there. And uh, so um, there's another view of that right here, this little angled window which projected outside the porch, just messy details with how that was all done with the trim and so forth. I think what was original to this house was an open porch and somewhere along the line someone wanted to enclose it and so this is what they had to do to enclose it. Mm -hmm. um, we took the opportunity um, uh, with thicker walls then therefore we were able to make that porch just you know a little bit wider which then helped us to eliminate this problem. So once again just mm -hmm. looking for creative architectural solutions to um, have the you know the form and the function and not have to you know choose one over the other. Mm -hmm. uh, Stuart's coming there with a picture of the back of the house, nice timing. You can see that compared to what's here today. So there's the existing. This is the existing, yes. This is a picture from three years ago. Mm -hmm. Now notice this has been bumped out nine feet so it's not exactly the same mm -hmm. uh, location. But we added on space where it was needed, you know, so we added on a certain amount of space to the master bedroom, which is right inside those Palladian windows. And that was as much as we needed to make that room work well and get the two walk-in closets. And we needed a little extra space for the bathroom. So you can see we've got a little extra bump out to the right there. You know, that's the master bathroom. And, uh, and then on the main level here, uh, we needed a little extra space to make the sunroom work and the mudroom. So that's how that uh, uh, all is incorporated and uh, composed for a beautiful... Uh, rear exterior. Well, great. Thanks for having us tour your house. We really appreciate it. You're most welcome, Brad. Um, Glad to show it off. Yeah, yeah, and we're really excited to help uh, uh, wrap up your Green Star Gold certification, lead mm -hmm. platinum, zero energy capable, and then mm -hmm. in a few months we'll you'll be one of our zero heroes, right? I on track, right? <laughs> Unless it gets really cloudy. So I'm looking <laughs> yeah. forward to it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So if everyone just real quick um, want to come through and just let us know where we can get more information about what you do um, as far as your website. And then, um, Mark, maybe you can tell us where they can find more information about the project. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, again, Mark Sloot with Sala Architects. Uh, we're online, um, www.salaarc.com. Mm -hmm. Find us easily. Uh, more information about this project, uh, we will soon have it on our website, and uh, there will also be uh, more available information on the Green Home, Green Home Institute's website when we get the project profile up there. Mm -hmm. uh, so okay. you should be able to, to find uh, all the information you want through those sources. Yeah. Um, there is a website for this house. Uh, it's kind of behind the times. It's not mm -hmm. an updated, but it has a lot on the early phases of the project. It's called Harriet Net Zero. It's a WordPress uh, site. Great. And uh, yes, we also welcome uh, school groups to come in for tours, mm -hmm. architecture classes, Votech classes. Uh, my wife and I are retired teachers, and we want this to be a demonstration for other people to have a chance to explore. All right. Party at Stewart's house. Though. <laughs> the project will also be on the Homes by Architect tour this September, but that's the uh, the local AIA's mm. um, home tour. Right. So you can come do a walk through then as well. Mm -hmm. As you guys can see, it is possible. Uh, my name is Andrew with Morrissey Builders, and you can find us at uh, www.morrisseybuilders.com. And I want to thank you for uh, taking the time to to do this. Um, uh, <clears throat> review of this house. Thank you.
Uh, again, Jason with Mossman Geothermal. Website is www.mossmangeothermal.com. That's spelled M-A-S-S-M-A-N-N. -S -S -M -M. Otherwise, look us up on Facebook. Thanks. And I'm Laura with Innovative Power Systems. We're at ips-solar.com. And uh, call us to get solar installed on your house or business. Okay. Thanks. Okay. All right, Thanks this has been uh, Green Home <laughs> Institute. Um, we'll be filming some more homes here shortly, so stay with us. Thank you. All right, so before we wrap up, I want to go over a couple different things here on, um, you know, just some follow-up things that we've learned after the tour and also just some um, setting you and your clients up for success to achieve these types of things. Um, so the first thing we have in front of us here is the Home Energy Rating Certificate. Um, and so this is the HERS Index rating uh, that is produced for LEED certified homes, um, typically used for major renovations uh, homes, zero energy homes typically use this program. There's other ways to do it. Uh, it is required in the LEED program though. Um, it's used in Green Star certification, though not required, but definitely helpful. And so what this does is, again, it just takes um, for the annual energy usage uh, credit under LEED, for example, it basically takes um, all the things you can think about in regards to energy efficiency, um, and that includes some ventilation um, and passive solar and solar energy, and puts it all together and then spits out um, the predicted energy usage. And so, um, you know, you can see as you go through this thing in the handout, you can see all of the energy efficiency details of the house that are accounted for within this HERS index rating. Um, so really what you want to do to be have uh, achieve something like this is you want to make sure to work very closely with your designer and your energy rater um, from the beginning. Um, and so a lot of times the approach to these types of things is kind of like, all right, well, you know, I built the house, it's ready to go, tell me how my rating is, and let's move on. But you're going to have a lot more success, especially in these early days of zero energy design, if you work with your rater uh, hands-on at the beginning and start producing drafts of these, many iterations of these drafts, to really get to where you and your clients want to be at. Um, so that helps ensure um, a negative or a net uh, positive number to ensure these levels of success. Now, a lot of people think that um, you can see this house has a negative 9 HERS index rating, so that means it's 109% more efficient than the standard International Energy Code 2006. Um, but, you know, a lot of people think that uh, a home with a, a zero HERS means a zero energy home, but that unfortunately is not always uh, correct because what the HERS index rating is is just a very arbitrary number that's designed for the mortgage industry, and it is not telling you energy usage whatsoever. Uh, now, it's a good indication that if you are uh, within the 10 to, you know, negative 10 range that you probably are zero energy. But we want to ask you to look a little bit deeper than that, um, and that is required if you want to achieve some of these zero energy capable certifications. So what you're going to look at is ignore the HERS index rating, even if it is tied to incentives or whatever, and come over at this estimated annual energy cost. And so what this is going to do is going to break down your MMBTU loads um, uh, per, uh, per type, per usage, and then what the estimated costs are and what the percentage of that is. Um, and then, of course, solar here is going to be a negative, and it's going to knock that down. So when you're working with your rater, your energy rater, or if you're working in REN design, you want to uh, drive this number down to below zero, and maybe just for even for some cushion, you know, make it uh, a negative three, a negative four, a negative five, um, just to help uh, offset any kind of weird weather operational uh, pattern. So um, this is something you want to work hands-on with your rater. You want to be looking at this number right here. This number can't go negative unless you throw in renewables. Um, it'll, you know, it'll, it won't be able to do that. So definitely that's important to, to, hitting, uh, to hitting zero energy and having those conversations um, before a hammer is swung and before the contracts are in place, um, ideally, rather than at the end of the project. Um, so here is the, the chart you can see for the International Living Future Institute's um, zero energy certification. And what we had to submit here, uh, going all the way back to October 16, uh, 2016, was um, energy received from the grid, energy provided to the grid, and then that would produce um, all these other n n um, numbers on net and total 
and all that. And then we would drop in gross square footage, um, and then it would convert over to kilowatt hours or KBTUs, um, and then it would give the house sort of our EUI without renewables and then EUI with renewables, which is something you can use for like the 2030 challenge. Um, so that's kind of what we did. We, we actually took a look at the real utility data over the course of a year. That's how you get the ILFI certification. Uh, so we did this after we filmed the, 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 the tour. They were still in the middle of tracking. And so what we were able to find is a, um, over the course of a year, by the way, while charging an electric car to some degree, not a fully electric car, um, they were able to be what we would call a net positive of um, just over 5,000 kilowatt hours over the course of a year. Um, and what's really important uh, uh, there is that a lot of people start think that energy modeling tools are not very accurate. They disparage them, and that's kind of one of the reasons that they don't get used at the beginning, like I said. But here I wanted to point out something really interesting. Um, so what we did is we took that negative 14 MMBTU that I just showed you on the last page, and we used unit juggler here. You can use anything to do it. Um, and you can convert it over to kilowatt hours. And so I just took a positive number, so it didn't get confused here. But this is really a negative 14. And so this would be a negative 4,000 kilowatt hours. So what our energy model told us at the beginning of the project, um, and then based on the post-construction testing analysis, because you know, HERS raters go in and they do the energy testing and make sure everything's done right, is that the house should be using you know, should be producing roughly 4,000 kilowatt hours a year. Uh, and this doesn't include the electric car. But the reality is, is that they um, actually produce um, 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 5,000. So only off by 1,000, which I don't know how picky you are or your clients are, but that's, you know, in my mind, that's really close. That is um, roughly 18% accurate um, if you're looking at it statistically. Um, now, again, I said the electric car was being used, so that's not accounting for that. Um, so, but anyway, it's heading in the right direction, right? So if it's saying it's, uh, you know, over promise or under deliver, over promise. So uh, uh, un uh, under promise, over deliver in this case um, for their project. So that doesn't happen with every project, but, um, you know, definitely worth pointing out. Now, the other thing I, I did want to point out, though, was that um, this does not include normalizing for, for weather. So um, the HERS index rating has built-in assumptions about weather at local weather station that's constantly updated and changed. Um, but as you know, especially with um, everything that's going on, weather can be a little bit crazy. Um, and so what we have to do is go in and take a look at um, heating degree days and cooling degree days to give it a more fair and accurate assessment to see why it was only 80% accurate. And so we went online to look at this um, DNR state, Minnesota, and then we were to kind of put in the time period here. This is really cool. Um, didn't even know this existed <laughs> until I was doing some research for this webinar. But we put in this time period here, uh, sort of the time that they were tracking their um, energy usage uh, to get their certification. And, um, and that spit out a bunch of data here that I'm, I'm kind of going to just summarize. But if you look at the Minneapolis area, you'll see the, 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 the average total heating degree days, which, you know, Minneapolis, very cold, climate zone six very focused on heating, um, was uh, 700, uh, 7,006, uh, just over, you know, 7,667. And so that, according to this thing, was a departure of nearly 1,356 heating degree days. Now, there are more calculations we could do. We could look at what the HERS heating degree days were and see how close we were. But what that really shows is that we really weren't um, off by 20%. We were much closer because the HERS, again, makes um, a set of assumptions based on predictions, and so the weather can vary all the time, but we know for the most part, um, for the next several years at least, until 50 or 100 years on, that we know that that weather is going to remain fairly within that target range. Um, and so it was a little bit of a less, it was a little bit of a warmer year, um, as we can anticipate. Um, now on the uh, cooling degree days, um, you can see here 84 over. So again, like I said, a little bit of a warmer year, but up in Minnesota, cooling barely makes a dent in energy usage at all. So that, you know, would offset this a little bit, but it wouldn't impact that much. So anyway, I just wanted to point that out because again, people say, well, energy model is, you know, you can look at it two ways. Was it 80% accurate or was it 20% inaccurate? And I would argue here that it's probably 93% accurate if you were to actually do the math uh, based on the, um, you know, the fact that it's locked in and it's heating degree days. 
All right. So the next biggest question then, of course, is going to that you your clients are going to ask you if you try to pitch this to them or if you want to build a house like this. Um, it, it, is it comfortable? And I can happy to report that right now I am I am it is it is it is 2018 just turned 2018, and as you know, if you look back at the news, uh, huge um, huge temperature um, drops throughout the country, and you know Minneapolis again. Climate Zone 6, it's one of the coldest places in the country all the time. So they are experiencing, I believe, um, you know, below average temperatures. So despite that, I talked to the homeowner steward and he was happy to report right before uh, I made this was that um, despite those record breaking um, temps at lower temps, uh, their geothermal field is maintaining its temperature without any kind of backup heat uh, so far throughout this cold winter season. Um, and um, you know they are very comfortable, uh, no complaints. And you know this is pretty much due not only to the advanced HVAC geothermal system, but you can't forget about the advanced air sealing, insulation, wall assembly, uh, persist method that went into making this house uh, very tight and comfortable. If it wasn't for that, that geothermal system would have failed instantly. Um, and then the other thing that Stuart wanted to point out too was that the solar system has produced half as much energy. Uh, during uh, that half as much energy uh, that they use um, in the dead of winter usually it doesn't produce any um, when they have the sunny days coming out so that's another very promising thing to show that yes they're still relying on the grid but they're able to pull um, at least half on some of the on the on the sunnier days in the in the dead of really cold winter so. Well, uh, I really want to thank you for uh, joining us here. Uh, I want to thank uh, all of our sponsors, Sun Intuitive Self Tinting Glass, uh, Built Equinox CRV, Geo Comfort Geothermal Systems, Niagara Conservation, Lowest Flowing uh, Toilet on the Planet, uh, Panasonic Ventilation, Certainty Air Renewed Formaldehyde Eating Drywall. Thank all of our members, all of our sponsors, um, volunteers, board of directors. Couldn't do it without them. Um, and if you're looking for your continuing ed, make sure to go take that 10 question quiz and secure an 80% passing rate. So thank you and please join us again. We're going to be doing way more tours, way more exciting stuff. Innovation just keeps happening and we're just excited to bring it to you.